of a lightman, which I know it, it always has fascinated me. So I hope you guys appreciate. I hope you guys like it. Like I, I don't know why. For some reason, it does. Like this whole change of thing with the science. Some reason I like the Renaissance. It's just like wow, all these amazing things happen. Um, but yeah, starting on Monday, they, they started opening up for certain pharmacies to allow teachers. But that wasn't the state. That was the president Biden. The state still isn't doing it. But since the fact the pharmacies have contracted out with the uh, um, federal government, Biden can order them. So I'm getting my own albums. <laughs> So Helen had it, but I'm sure it was almost all teachers. They filled up their position. They're, so I couldn't get it. Um, and I pulled the largest version, right? You with me on that? I'm too old, right? There you go. You're going to plus eight in your nose. All right. So went through with Locke. And the big thing about Locke is this idea that uh, your know, morals, virtues come from this clean slate, and we're just. Uh, and our environment, our teaching comes up to it, but this one, I want to make sure we reset that. I'll be about that for Everybody has rights, and it's endowed by the Creator. What is the religion? It's not really, it's not really a religion. It's more of a philosophy for the creation. What is that called? When the, when the Creator is the clockmaker, you know, where they turn the light off. What is that called? Yeah, that's deism. And so it really fits in that Newtonian change. Now, there's going to be a big backlash, kind of a religious, but uh, the term conservative will be used after, with the French Revolution uh, of the Enlightenment. We'll come to that. So life, liberty, and property, that's independent life, freedom of conscience or free will, and then the right to have property. And the big thing to have the property, I think the bell rang right when I would say this, controlling your own property means that you truly have the other two rights. If at any time, the powers that be can take your property, you don't have rights. Do you, later philosophers, I think Collider and a couple others had that um, they changed property, which sounds just like property, like accumulating wealth to uh, the pursuit of happiness, which is in the Declaration of Independence. And that says not only property, but also your most valuable property, your mind, your abilities. But that's the natural rights. And you notice it's not laws. These are more nebulous. It's, it's hard to define these. Okay, so let's get down to what that meant. So, what that meant is then, if by God and a deist would say creator, that's what our Declaration of Independence said, creator or nature's God, government gets their power from the people. So the people give up a little bit of their, their freedoms To, get their, to give their power to the government. And this is a contract. Future philosophers will call this a social contract to protect rights. So that's why government exists. People will give up a little bit. And that's why give up a little bit to get these rights. That's why divine right is a, a scam according to Locke. The people always have the power. Now, the king will always try to say, I get my power from above, not only to set up their son as the next king, but also to justify everything they do. You can't resist me, I get my power from God. But Locke is saying, no, the people give the power, and so the same thing can happen to a king. They can throw a king out, like they can elect a new leader if it was a republic. And so, if government infringes on rights, it must be removed. And what it removed me, it could be a new government, it could be revolution. And this is almost verbatim what's in the United States Declaration of Independence. That's why I have Franklin, Livingston, Sherman, Adams, and Jefferson, the authors of the Declaration of Independence right there. The United States was very much an enlightened country created by them. And and don't forget one thing about this whole thing about God and the deism. And deism was a creator. They didn't want it to be an interactive God or even a religious God. 
They just fought all those religious wars. We can't have that again. You can be religious, but not in the government. That leads to war. And so, the glorious revolution in 1688 that removed King James II and put William and Mary in power, this is what Locke is talking about. When Locke wrote the two treatises of government, it was two years, about a year and a half, actually, after the Glorious Revolution. So he's saying William and Mary should be on the throne because James was depriving people of their natural rights. And so what does that mean? The last thing about Locke. Oh, therefore the Republic is the best form of government. A Republic, a government by representation. Now that could be a government by representation with a monarchy. We'll call that eventually a constitutional monarchy. Like my ear is really sore. This, for some reason, this mask is really hitting my ear. Sometimes they don't. I'm using the disposable mask. This one's really getting this ear. So my also start rubbing my ear. You know why? So republic is the best form of government. And so Britain had a constitutional monarchy with a parliament's a republican form of government, then the king is a head of state. But that's why the United States is a republic. So that leads directly to another child of the Enlightenment a little bit later, but we have to mention him here, Thomas Paine. We'll come back to him. Now, Thomas Paine, uh, only one to, don't worry about the rights of man, we'll come back to that. Write down common sense. And, did you notice what I did? It's supposed to be dirt, do. <laughs> and I wasn't watching Thomas Tyke. Common sense would be written to justify the American Revolution. And it said that he said, fitting and unlock, kings only have power by lack of birth. So why should we follow a king if they're depriving us of our rights? So Thomas Paine is going to have great influence, and then he'd go on and support the French Revolution. That all people have rights. Thomas Paine would be, would take the Enlightenment to its furthest extent, but I have to mention him with Locke because he fits in with that idea. We have rights. By the way, he was different than Locke or even Jefferson. He not only believed men have rights, he believed all men, regardless of color or skin, and women. He also um, feared the property in the hands of a very few. Thomas Paine. And these ideas, I'm going to jump the gun here. He, uh, by the way, the French Revolution would get so out of control, he was all for it until they nearly put him to the sent him to the guillotine. He barely made it with his life. We're going to jump right to this. And that leads to something called the enlightened individual. Somebody who read Locke, later on led Cain and the other philosopher. Those who tried to look for natural laws, and they killed himself. They were called the philosophe. And here's a painting of a classic philosophe. And this is a clever painting. So it's a young, it's kind of aristocratic. So don't think of this term in terms of like working people demanding rights. These are a lot of idealized, relatively wealthy people on the edge of wealthy, imagining a perfect world. They don't want to really change their life. It's more like this idealized version. And so, a, He's supposed to be thinking about this, and it's a combination of science, but you know, it's talk, just fun of talk, and how can society balance it. It's a clever, a clever painting. I like it. You know, it's not just some uh, boy watching the top. Did you know that was a top? <laughs> I don't know anybody look like a top. So, what they believe is, in a lot of thinking, is there can be change. We must encourage change and progress. Here's the thing, you're going to get all these silly soft who before the French Revolution and tell the people of the French Revolution say, yes, and we want uh, we want your some of your property because you have too much. It's like, no, 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 no. They want the change in progress as long as it doesn't affect their nice life. And a couple more things about it. They are committed though to reforms, but it's still it's a top-down reform. And lastly, it's an optimistic view. So enlightened views, ideally, would be this concept that um, we are going to get better, we can get better. And the United States very much has that attitude. Right? At least 
historically, there's always the belief we're getting better. I know it's more complex than that. I know it goes up and down. But there's that belief in progress. And there will be a conservative backlash. In fact, the backlash will be those people who see this change in reform and write big letters next to it. They want more liberty. They want liberty. And that's where the term liberal comes from. They also call it libertine during this time. And those who say, no, you have too much liberty. You're demanding too many of these rights that come with liberty. By 1791, they'll be called conservatives. And the basis of modern conservative thought will come out of reaction to these philosophies. And they would mean, oh, these would be the, you have to write this down, just these centers of the enlightenment, some places where there's education, large cities like Paris, Berlin, and Peter the Great started it, and his successor, Catherine the Great, would do this. Try to bring in uh, sort of an enlightenment, oh, here in Italy, because the universities were there. But Paris, because of Louis XIV, in many ways, is becoming the cultural center of Europe. And that's why Versailles is there. Even though the Sun King was opposed to enlightened thinking, you have these people coming together to talk and uh, about this. And this is a salon. This one we do have to get. This is where the fiddle sauce would be. And salons would be places where a wealthy elite, they would go eat, maybe drink wine, talk. This is where the elite would talk about their visions of progress. But I can't emphasize this enough. They're all for progress as long as their life doesn't have to change. Do they still want to keep their very comfortable lives? And this always comes into conflict where you have philosophers will kind of help start the French Revolution, but then when regular folk will demand their rights, then things get very, the only way to describe it is very messy, as in lots of beheadings. So let's jump right to this. We're jumping to. These are three American philosophers, and you need to write these down because it's something out from American history. But these names, hopefully, they should be familiar to anybody on American history. I think all of you have American history. We just got to know year, right? You think it next year? But you probably heard of John Adams, our second president, Ben Franklin, the author of the Declaration of Independence. By the way, they both died on July 4, 1826, 50 years after the Declaration of Independence was signed. And you notice life liberty, the pursuit of happiness. It's very much John Locke in this sense. But let's get to a couple more philosophers. One I, one I kind of like, even though he's kind of a, uh, a moocher. <laughs> and the other one I, I can't decide. So let's just jump to, we're, we're going to skip this. We're skipping this. We're going to Voltaire. So Voltaire. Now, Voltaire is also, his actual real name was Francois Marie Arlette. But uh, it was, we went by the pen name Voltaire, and there's a very tiny looking uh, painting of it. Now, you don't need all this. The only one you need to have is Candide. Candide is probably the most famous work where it was very much satire. And satire is explaining a real event, but exaggerating details for humorous effect. So, uh, all of you probably know satire. If you've ever seen like Saturday, Saturday Night Live, that's. The most pretty crude satire, but it's satire. Sat Duke satire is actually my favorite type of thing. You know, if it's really, if it like really makes fun and mocks something that's real in such a way you can learn something from it, you know, things like that. I really like it. Candy does that about the aristocracy and modern life, okay, modern life of the 1750s. But let's get to Voltaire then. Voltaire had a series of criticisms. Views towards the state. It's a little more complex than saying Voltaire had a certain philosophical background the way states could be. But he was a deist. He criticized organized religion. And the older he got, the more he believed that prayer organized religion was a way to control people. He considered it, in fact, let me give you one of his most famous quotes about organized religion that he thought was tying people down to dogma and not allowing them to think or enjoy their rights. Oh, and he thought, well, we hated all bigotry and intolerance, but he saw organized religion as the most bigoted and intolerant of all elements. But that also included other elements, his limited knowledge about colonialism. 
And you might think, well, um, especially if someone is religious now, they think, well, wait a minute, why does he hate you know, things that church is big, bigoted and intolerant? You know, we just have horrific wars over religion. They're killing each other because they're Catholics or Calvinists or Lutherans. So, or uh, crusades against Muslims. And so he is looking at that saying, yeah, look what they do. So don't forget the context of what he's speaking. Now, he would say about organized religion, we must crush the infamous beast. Hmm. Even though kind of that's what we saw was hey, but that's another story. So crush the infamous beast. And this really fit in well with the philosophers. We saw them. I'm going to be above the mob, the masses who do this and believe religion, and I will go for theism or whatever it might be. But he believed the best form of government, his criticism was, or and we'll get to the criticism in a sec. He said, all forms of governments are horrible. What we need is an enlightened despot. Now, you might remember despotism or despot from ancient Greek and the city states, or that. It just simply means a single person in charge, but more and more a despot is going to mean somebody who has total power, an authoritarian. But you notice it doesn't necessarily mean an absolute monarch, so it could be a republic. So his whole thing would be an enlightened monarch or an enlightened despot. He follows Plato. Plato kind of had the same idea, but a despot is somebody with full power. But we normally think of a despot as somebody who abuses that power, which, to be honest, yeah. Whenever somebody has ultimate power, they tend to abuse it. Like, look what I do to you people. There's only down to two of you left. By the way, next week I will have a CD chart. I really don't know how many people. I think we find as many as six. Every week in my life. So we're not going to hurt anyone. We're just going. We're kind of used to it now. I just go on. Don't snow anymore. Okay, so. So he was a little bit, remember Hobbes? Hobbes wrote that people are like a, a turbulent beast and you need a strong monarch to control them. Remember Hobbes? I talked about Hobbes when I talked about Cromwell, the Leviathan. You need a strong leader. Voltaire kind of believed that too. He thought the average person was turbulent, was unthinking. They only think about their own personal gain. So we need a strong leader. Two examples of that would be Frederick the Great and Catherine the Great. Also, Joseph II of the uh, Austrian Empire. In fact, there's, uh, Voltaire would go to Prussia. It's Frederick the Great of Prussia. And they saw themselves as governing with enlightened principles. They'll do what's best for the people, but at the same time, they are a despot. They are in full control. By the way, they talked a good game, but when it came right down to it, they both would do whatever they wanted. When they want to talk. And well, maybe you really heard this today. This mask, somebody must be just the angle of this one mask. And with that, uh, he did not believe people were equal. You know, he, he did not believe that the Lord flash should have power. You know, this is just a few people on top and then have an enlightened leader. So he believed this equality under the law. Everybody should follow the law, but not equality of classes. The lower class is lower class because they are inferior and should be on the bottom. We don't want the vast majority of people with a voice. Therefore, he does not believe in democracy or anything like democracy. He does not believe that people should have a greater voice in government because he doesn't think they're ready. So that's Voltaire. And this is a great Voltaire quote. But actually, this is kind of true. And let me just give you some, oh, we're going to jump right to this. Voltaire's Wisdom. I know it's silly. There's Candide, by the way. It's a good book. He doesn't write this down. Here's just some quotes from Voltaire. I like this. So Voltaire, part of Voltaire's brilliance was he could come up with very pithy, uh, clever little statements that make him seem very smart. Because, yeah, this is kind of true. If you're not, if you know something should be done for good and you don't do it, you're guilty of it. You should do what's good. 
course, that's easy to say to somebody. Uh, easy to say um, when you're not going to put your neck on the line to do that. Good. Here's another good quote for his. Okay, I just think that's funny. But do you see how? He, oh, isn't he cute? Why does he say that? His, relation, his point of view is relation to being used to control people, thus the bottom line. Let me give you another one. It's dangerous to be right when the government is wrong. I think we can get that one pretty quick. Especially if the government is a despot. Okay, love and truth part. Love, love, truth, pardon. Look for truth. Actually, I kind, I kind of agree with that one. I have another one, by the way. But this is not the less creepy statue. I think that's a little bit uh, too pithy. So, men are equal. Virtue is what defines it. But what defines virtue? And that's actually very true. And it's the way to become boring is to say everything, as I'm telling you right now. And then you've probably heard that statement before, haven't you? Have you ever heard this one? Say yes. Have you heard this one before? That's a pretty common one. And people always say that. Usually people who say this actually want people to shut up. <laughs> so sorry, look how online I am. Now shut up. So let's get to the next one. Dennis Diderot. And Diderot, about the same time frame, and Diderot has this tie into the scientific revolution. I like this painting. I've told you this before. More and more you can tell a portrait because they think, Men under the age of about 35 look like uh, young women, and older look like elderly women, regardless if they're male or female. But deep, don't write this down. Uh, um, this is a quote, this is what his belief was. Examine, debate, investigate, look at everything. That's what deep and belief. And therefore, we must look at everything and debate and discuss and experiment, which fits in with the scientific method, doesn't it? Fits in with the scientific revolution. If we must do this, this is what we have to get. Oh, I almost got one more thing. We must speak against sense of laws until they're reformed, and while we wait, we must apply them. Meaning, he's still under control. We must not like sense of laws, but we gotta follow them. Catherine will get like that. But let's get to what he created. He created the encyclopedia. And the encyclopedia, this is what we do have to get. The encyclopedia would accumulate all this knowledge, all of it, put it together in one, at first it's just one big volume, but eventually so many volumes. Here's one of the covers of one of the first encyclopedias. Remember the printing press is such a big deal in this. Put together everything under one volume. So it is all knowledge. So this is going to have everything from all the new social sciences and all the new sciences put together in one volume. So Dino's point of view was, if you have this at your hand, your fingertips, you will have the ability to understand larger events, to explain and debate and make rational decisions. It is through the knowledge, through your knowledge, where you can have true freedom. Because if you don't know things, you will always be at the mercy of somebody who knows more. Always. Because there's probably certain things that if you try to debate me on, you probably do very well. I know there's some things I would do well with you. But I bet like certain things like, you know, like politics right now, I think you probably wouldn't do as well. It doesn't mean you don't know more, but that knowledge could be used for me against you. It's your only way to know. And his thought was, we can know everything. So eventually 28 volumes. And here's the big thing. It will be this new thing called designed by alphabetical. Now they had alphabet before, but they never indexed it alphabetically. He did that. Also, in the data universe chain, they had cross-referencing, where it's going to be indexed and cross-referenced in the back of the book. 
So you can look things up and try to connect where things connect in the book in an index. So you can find things and see how they relate. And unbelievable illustrations. Wikipedia is an amazing thing. Now, when I was your age, you know, we didn't have the internet or the computers. And so the encyclopedia was the way to get good basic information anytime you wanted. And it's so weird, it's still kind of weird for me today. So I have an old uh, Collier's Encyclopedia back here. All the volumes back here. You open it up and it has everything in it. Now, on, online, the internet, we, it does that now. Quicker and easier than looking into the book, even though sometimes you might you don't absorb it as well, but it does the same thing. By the way, does this make you smart? He thought it would. The problem with this is, if you have this encyclopedia, or for that matter, you now have your phone where you can look everything up, are you smart? Because this becomes a crutch. If you think you can look it up so you don't need to know it, then you don't know it. And if you don't know it, it becomes more difficult to, crit to think critically about events. It's really hard to think about stuff if you don't have good background knowledge. And you might say, well, I'll look up about the, uh, the difficulties of Keynesian economics, which I know you both know, obviously, Keynesian economics. I can tell you everything you need to know about Keynesian economics. Could you? You're both very smart. People at home are very smart. So what do you have to do? OK, I have to stop. I can't think about it. And I will look it up and then process what I looked up. Make a decision now about it. If you can look everything up, it's a great tool, but it's very difficult. That's the problem with this. People got this and thought, I don't need to know anything about it. Trust me, the more you know, the better you can critically think. The less you know, it's almost impossible to think. When I mean no, I'm not talking intelligent, like you're smart or not smart. I'm just talking about what you can recall. By the way, remember we saw the thing in the, the great bit about the printing press and the day the universe changed, how people lost their memories and what they can read. This is what they're talking about. And I'm not, I'm, I promise you I'm not doing the, in my day we have things tougher line. I have a better memory than you. Significantly better. Because I didn't have those when I was growing up, so I had to know. So I was trained to learn. And you guys will probably have better memories than the next generation after you. Because you're like three generations after me. I don't know. But not quite for you. Not quite. But the point is um, every generation is still behind. So this is now actually good advice. Train your memory. Smart, can help you with school. By the way, how do I do? How do I remember everything that I remember? I don't have a photographic memory that's not even close. By the way, you know anybody with a photographic memory? Don't you hate them? Would you hate them if I had a friend like that? You could, you could tell him something, and five months later, he did. I, I knew this guy used to be a football coach at the University of Montana, and he met me when I was a junior in high school this football thing, and I saw him again 25 years later, and he remembered my name completely. He used to be the quarterback coach, and he was the head coach. Yeah, and he saw me again, oh, James Murphy, he says, Jesus, that's impressive. Um, to me, it's like a song. Once I remember one thing, like you remember a song, you know, like if you can't like, like write the words down, but you start hearing the music and you remember the words, that's what it's like for me. I remember one thing that leads to another thing leads to another thing. Leads to. So that still a pretty amazing thing. And he would have great influence, Peter. Eventually, you don't need to practice that. I just put that on 751. That first encyclopedia. It would revolutionize. And by the way, this, okay, obviously I don't expect you to know how much a uh, believer of it is. But almost no one could afford this. So this is only for the very well. That is why libraries for the public would be such a big deal for knowledge. And today, that's why if you don't have access to the internet and all the people at home know exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, think about it. We've had to all learn this in the last year. 
if you don't have access to the information, how far behind you can get. Even if you're smarter than anyone else, if you don't have the same access to the information, you're in a hole. So, so these are just some pages. I thought these are pretty cool. Aren't those amazing drawings? Everything from uh, practical applications on how to iron a suit to um, biological drawings. You look at pretty darn good drawings of a hand to flora and fauna. This is about farming and farming. I think I put one more page. Yeah. So how to build a canal. Which, by the way, we should start building more canals. Here's um, puddling steel, and here's how to make a chair. So I had, if you get the point, everything. Look at that one. The human body and all the muscles. Back then, so by the 18th century, they were doing complex. Uh, dissections of humans and people would pay of uh, cadavers. And it was okay in most places to do a cadaver as long as they weren't from there and they weren't Christian or Catholic or you know, whatever the religion might be. By the way, what makes a dead person not Christian? They're dead. So what makes them not Christian? You're not a Christian. And so grave robbing became a big deal in the 18th and 19th century. You robbed. Crushing those graves and say, there's no body. Um, so, in fact, that became as you want to guard your family's graves until we come and cut them open. And they have these very tall, almost like a cylinder arenas where students could look all of them, you know, 10 stories high. There's one in Bologna, I guess, it's the biggest one ever. And you can look down and watch the person dissect. Have you seen a dissection? I saw a little bit of one of a cadaver in a class once. It was disconcerting, even though it was no blood and it was all, but it was still, I didn't like it. I don't want to see what a liver looks like. Okay, so you don't need to write this down, but to give you an idea how Catherine the Great loved it. And all the dictionary, you can see where it spread all through the city. So France, you know, this is basically France, but in the brick. So let's get to Montesquieu. Now, we, we don't need to write down this book down, but those are, uh, and screwing a lot of the biggie, but Montesquieu would be this next stage. And by the way, you notice how they draw him, and they try to make him a little bit like a Roman senator. That was really calm. So we're going past this monarchs and dark age, and we're going back to the Roman Republic. This classic, the classics were still so valuable. If you look at the architecture of that era, it is still copying the Roman architecture. I mean, look at the early United States. All the government buildings built at that time try to look like Roman buildings. And you go there to Washington, D.C. today, they still all look like Roman buildings because that was just, they kept doing it. But this is what we have to get about Montesquieu. So he was, was young at the death of Louis XIV. So he's writing about the absolute monarchs, Louis XIV and Louis XV. He is influenced by others, especially Voltaire. But his philosophy was this. There are basically three types of governments. Now you notice I did not put democracy because everyone thought democracy was crazy. Are you a greater people? Well, that's nuts. But there's a monarchy, so that's an inherited monarchy. There's a republic. We've talked about republics and despotism. We talked about despotism. Those are the three. All three. So authoritarian, but a monarch's pretty authoritarian too. And he wrote this in the spirit of the law. And so what he believed is this. We need a form of government, we as in people, that will separate the different political powers. It will separate it. And that's the only way to assure the freedom and liberty of all people. We have to separate the powers. And if you look at those three forms of government, all the government in a monarchy is in the power of the king. All the government here is in the power of the despot. So he said, we need <coughs> for help. <coughs> so I need to drink water. Breathe through the mask, you know. And so, with that, last thing for today. <coughs> what are the three forms of government? 
There's the judicial, so the justice system. There's the legislative, and the legislative are the ones who make the laws. And then there's the executive, and the executive is the one that carries out and interprets the laws. So, there's a, they judge, create laws, carry out the laws. In a monarchy and a despot, and in a, in a despotism, that's one person does all three. That's one person does all three. So we need a republic, and therefore you can divide the three powers. So put the judicial in one group, the executive in another, and the legislative in another. And that's Montesquieu. I think I have one more. No. So Montesquieu. I've got one more slide. But James Madison, the father of the U.S. Constitution, was greatly influenced by Montesquieu. So the United States has clear well, not but fairly clear separation of powers. There is an executive branch, a legislative branch, and then will become a very clear judicial branch. It's got to be in different hands, and therefore, no one group can be a tyrant. Or, no one group can be above the law. And this is the best way to ensure freedom and liberty. So we now have Voltaire, we have a Thomas Paine, we have a few other things, Diderot, but now Montesquieu. And these will have great influence on the United States. But there's some flaws with this, but that's another story. So the rest of this I'll have to finish tomorrow. So we'll do the quiz, I'll finish it, and I'll check online in case I do get a little sick from my job, but I don't know. All right, sound good? Partridge. Yes. I don't remember. Did you say we were doing some sort of video this week, or was that last week that I'm thinking of? Yeah, I don't think we're gonna do a video this week. I thought about one, but I think we're gonna have to. Uh, we'll finish up any content this week, and I'll give you the list of terms for the test. I'll, I'll post it tomorrow. I'll give it to you tomorrow. Okay. Thanks. I don't think so. Unless you want it, you want test Friday. I think it's just going to have to work out to be next week. And there's a lot of stuff I'll give you the list. I'll give it to you on. Uh, I'll give it tomorrow. I'm just not part of it. Uh, there's still a few things I'm going to have. And I'll try to make it. There's a lot of stuff, so I'm going to really try to narrow it down. I was going to do the test earlier, but we're running up against the French Revolution. And that is such a big event. It's got to be something. French Revolution. I'm not going to be in, like, the class tomorrow. Oh, yeah, okay. And then I'll have to see you on Friday. I understand, yeah. So. There's a good chance you'll be gone Friday, too. Yeah, I think. I think you, but still. Yeah, um, I'll put it online. Okay. And I'll make sure I post it so everything will, will pop up, so don't worry about it. And, uh. I'll try to get that list done. I'm not even trying to do it for now. I want to get it done. I just started working on it. I'm embarrassed to say, but it's something we've all done this. I thought I finished. You know? I don't get No, I didn't finish it. I thought I did. But I'll get that out there. And I'll put, and I'll give you hints for the short IDs. Because this is a, such a broad unit, I'll, I'll make sure I, I'll put it down which one else. Who do you got tomorrow again? Uh, yeah, they're. I don't really know, but they have quite a few good girls on their side. I don't know. But the record's not very good. No, it's like, it's not. It feels like it should be better. Those are always scary, though. Those are traps. That's what, yeah, I don't know. We've never played before. Yeah. Who knows? I just noticed something. Look at this. So I went on YouTube to make sure my things are. Oh, yeah. And then we have me wandering around. <laughs> oh, uh, good luck tomorrow. We'll see you. Thank you. Have a safe drive with you. All right.
Oh, you know it. 